Get a Book Dot Today presents Strike Battleship Engineers. Book 2 in the Starships at War series by Shane Lachlan Black. Copyright 2017. Senior Crew Chief Sean Brogan stood resolute before the floor-to-ceiling coolant transfer control bank at the base of Argent Fusion Reactor 4. His feet were shoulder-width. He was closing and opening his fingers, preparing himself for what was about to happen on Argent's engineering deck. The last time he had worked with a von Mansfried fusion plant was when he was obtaining his ratings for operating multi-reactor warships. Prior to being assigned to Islington's command, he was one of the fleet's preeminent fission specialists. It wouldn't have taken him long to get up to speed on the newest in starship power systems, but he was in such high demand elsewhere in the fleet, he didn't have as much time as he would have liked. He rubbed his bald head with freshly limbered up fingers and took a deep breath. The equivalent power plant aboard Minstrel was roughly the size of a small delivery van. This beast was nearly ten stories tall and had seven backups just like it. All right, Corporal, watch the screen next to your controls and make sure it is set to mnemonics display mode before we start the clock. Do you have that set up? There will be a circle with four dots inside it at the base of the display. Corporal Nathan Dempsey was not far away, stationed at the multi-axis reaction mass control bank. The display has a circle with four dots. I think it's set up correctly, sir. Don't call me, sir. I'm a crew chief. I drive starships. Aye, chief. All right. We've got a clean chamber. Now we're going to do this by the numbers. Because if we hork the procedure, we'll have to manually scram the reactor and start over. But we won't get a chance to start over because we'll burn up. You tracking me, corporal? Aye, chief. By the numbers. Laser capacitance chamber set to standard timing. Rate 0009 or 2. Mark. Okay, I've got colors, shapes, and a bunch of text on the screen. Just read me everything in yellow, and follow the mnemonics as they appear on the screen. They will show you what controls to operate. The green text is your instructions. Aye. Chamber temperature 81 degrees and rising with intolerance envelope. Stand by. 21 seconds. Corporal Dempsey shouted. There was no going back. Cold starting Argent's number 4 fusion reactor had to be done on a precisely timed clock, with the last 10 to 15 steps performed to within computer-controlled tolerances of fractions of a millisecond. There was little room for error, as the initial reactions took place with the union of deuterium isotopes, a precisely controlled magnetic field, and a high-powered mode-locked laser firing from hundreds of thousands of disparate axes. If they were successful, and the timing was right, Reactor 4 would initiate its first controlled fusion reaction, programmed to last for just over 30 seconds in generating more than 60 megawatts of electrical power. The first run, as it was called, was just enough to establish a containment field so they could increase reaction mass to 1% power. Chief Brogan used both hands to close the enormous junctions for the metallic liquid sodium coolant reservoir. One of the key tasks to be completed in time for the first power transfer from the reactor would be to pour a fantastic amount of heat into the coolant sink, then throw power to the conductive electromagnetic pressure energy transfer system so heat could be bled out of the reaction matrix at a rapidly increasing rate. As more fuel was introduced into the chamber, the amount of excess heat that would have to be carried away would begin to climb. Since Argent sodium coolant was electrically conductive, its reactor heat transfer systems were based on the same scientific principles as her Havoc batteries and fighter launch tunnels. They were essentially continuously powered railgun-like pipes that moved the coolant along by manipulating electromagnetic energy. At just over 12% power, coolant would be pressurized into a uniform balanced mass and move through the pipelines at supersonic speeds, a process called superstreaming. The computer-controlled near-zero turbulence of the sodium coolant inside the conduits was what made the von Mansfried reactor design a reality. It increased electrical energy yields more than 40% above the next best competing design without increasing size or exceeding equivalent fuel consumption. The result was a cooling system that could compete respectably with the Grand Coulee Dam in terms of how much mass it could move from one place to the next in a given interval. Tertiary phase energy transfer panels at base capacitance. Affirmative! Secondary phase energy transfer panels at plus 1 volt per 20 mL square. Confirmed! Primary phase energy transfer panels at plus 1.3 volts per 9 mL square. Affirmative. Stand by to activate multi-axis laser control sequencer. Fuel in the chamber in six seconds. Mark. Red LEDs activated one by one down the left side of Brogan's coolant panel, indicating the moment when the first deuterium isotopes would be injected into the lattice origin for the multi-axis laser device. It would only be targetable by the mode-locked emitter for a few thousandths of a second. 
so everything had to happen at precisely the correct moment. Injectors aligned. Maximum yields. Coolant sink on standby condition green. Chamber temperature 280 degrees and climbing. Plasma barrier in 60 seconds, Dempsey shouted. The sound of millions of cubic feet of coolant accelerating through the overhead conduits caused the deck to vibrate gently. Then the vibrations began to intensify. Stand by to activate ignition sequencer. On my mark. Five, four, three, two. Dempsey clamped both gloved hands on the two-inch thick bar switch at the top of his panel. It was surrounded by so many warning signs he prayed he was performing the correct procedure. He felt like his heart and several ribs were about to climb into his throat. The roar of the cooling system didn't help. He heard Chief Brogan shout, One! and pulled with all his strength. There was a metal-on-metal metal groan, and then the switch slid into the down position with a mighty thump. Red LEDs activated around the top edge of all the control mechanisms. A klaxon sounded. The LEDs began to slide in a pattern around the circular reaction chamber. Light bathed the four-story tall number four painted on the aft bulkhead in an ominous crimson glow. Chamber temperature now, 3410 degrees and rising, Dempsey shouted. It was on his screen in yellow, so he reported it. 3000 degrees sounded like something out of a science fiction story, but Marine corporals weren't paid to think. They were paid to follow the orders of senior crew chiefs when it came to the ship and these finicky expensive machines that kept them running. Skywatch policy for Starship non-commissioned Marines was fairly simple. If it moves, salute it. If it doesn't move, pick it up. If you can't pick it up, paint it. Ha ha! Brogan shouted. Fire in the hole! A moment after the chief's voice echoed through the chamber just loud enough to be heard over the coolant roar, a deep resonant buzz filled the metal floor with a powerful vibration. The power readings on Brogan's console suddenly jumped to life, and he punched the reactor comm station channel control. Engineering to bridge! A pause. Go ahead, chief! Ensign Grant shouted trying to make himself heard over the thunder of the cooling systems he could hear in his own headset. Transfer all power to reactor control. Stand by to engage the mains. Grant hurried to the bridge engineering station and quickly authorized the correct series of power transfers. Affirmative chief. Reactor control at the engineer's command. Brogan's face was lit by the command display's message as it conveyed total control of the entire ship's power grid to a single console. He reverently let his fingers rest on the keyboard. All of the vessel's command and control mechanisms were now accessible from his station. He carefully directed Reactor 4's energy output to energize the reaction containment field. Bridge. Engineering. Main power now at 0.2% capacity and climbing. Argent is hot. Request permission to cold start Reactor 5. You are go, engineering. Mains engaged. Take us to 15% as quickly as you can. Brogan proudly walked over to the mass control bank. Corporal Dempsey was wide-eyed and looked as if he had just escaped a burning building. Congratulations, Corporal. Brogan shook Dempsey's hand. You just turned the key and started a battleship. Chapter 24 Kilo Alpha 3 rolled out of the Sarn formation and attempted a textbook evasive peel, but wasn't prepared for the other Skywatch ships. Black 7 came screaming in on 3's starboard edge. Her wings were raised like a belligerent sand crab weapons glowing with barely restrained destructive energy. Behind the angry-looking little gunship loomed the guns of the escort frigate Minstrel. Dominique, how come there's a big red three on the screen? Please specify readout identifier, Commander. Each is labeled underneath the console control section. Oh, it says Takatil Display 11. Tactical Display 11 is tracking the position of inbound contact Kilowatt Alpha 3. What's that? Kilowatt Alpha 3 is a Sarn Agitator class interceptor destroyer with primary Type 4 energy mounts forward and an enhanced point defense battery aft. She displaces approximately 40,000 tons with a crew of 105 officers and men. Are they bad guys? Kilowatt Alpha 3 is designated a hostile contact with 98.4% confidence. Can we fight them? Affirmative, Commander. A brand began to perform her own combat readiness procedure which consisted of making sure Boots was on her left side and Checkers was at her right. She straightened her oversized helmet as best she could, but it kept slipping down over her eyes. She still couldn't see anything clearly outside Black 7's forward viewports, so she grabbed the controls of Black 7 and started turning the maneuvering bar back and forth. Fortunately for her, the gunship was still under the primary auto system's control. She hadn't made the mistake of disengaging the battle computer, mainly because she didn't know how and likely wouldn't do so even if she did. She liked talking to Dominique too much. 
So for the time being, Black 7 at least looked like it was crude and battle-ready. It was all scant consolation for Destroyer No. 3. Its captain would later undoubtedly receive commendation for being the only commander in the attack force well prepared enough to actually engage the Skywatch formation, such as it was. The only problem was, the Sarn weren't all that well acquainted with Tarantula Hawk technology. Black 7's panic reactors went into full overload configuration. The ferocious little gunship's forward battle screens amplified to the point where they were easily equivalent to a cruiser's defenses. For a ship this small, such energy loads couldn't be maintained for long, but the key to gunship combat was knowing when and where to focus the first power burst. It was the T-Hawk way. Start no fight before your opponent has been punched in the mouth at least once. Kilo Alpha 3 opened up with her entire four-gun main battery. Under normal circumstances, the disruptive energy of Sarn anti-ship weapons would do considerable damage to a full-size starship. White-hot beams of explosive plasma flashed through space and slammed into the oncoming forward section of Black 7. A strobing deflection blast lit up space for a thousand miles. The gunship tumbled out of its attack run and spun past Destroyer 3, forward screens fighting on the one hand to turn aside the enemy firepower, and on the other hand to contain and absorb as much of the energy as possible to channel into its own reactors. A Bren clutched boots and checkers tightly and shrieked. The entire universe turned into a spinning, tumbling roar. Overload alarms went off all over the board, and the reddish glow of the gunship's battle alert filled the inside of the cabin. Dominique! What's happening? A coolant junction burst in the aft section, filling the interior of the ship with a deafening hiss. Abren held onto her helmet with both hands and screamed again, but the sound of her voice was overwhelmed by the blast of escaping superheated vapor. The command computer did not answer, as the entire vessel's operational capacity was working on the problem of avoiding a second hit from the destroyer's main guns. The battle computer's suggested course of action overrode the rest of the options, as expected. After all, Black 7 was anything but a cargo shuttle. Fortunately for everyone involved, it turned out Abrain's constant outdoor adventures, climbing, exploring, and running around, had unexpectedly prepared her for the next maneuver. The gunship's main engines surged to 140% of their rated power, just long enough to right the spinning vessel's navigational orientation. Somehow, Abren managed to survive the resulting 7G turn without losing consciousness. The new heading gave Black 7 a magnificent 5-point weapons lock on Kilo Alpha 3's dorsal hull. The battle computer was just about to request a firing order when the not-quite-ten-years-old command pilot unexpectedly shouted, clutching her plush animals, Get him, Dominique! Get him! The battle computer interpreted Abran's outburst as a firing order. It instantly deactivated the safety protocols and set the gunship to weapons free. Less than a second later, Black 7 opened up on the attacking Sarn destroyer. Electromagnetic shields flashed and burned with arcing plasma energy as the angry little gunship's brawler cannons tore gash after gash in the destroyer's battle screens. The Sarn warship's hull lurched and shook with the punishment until it finally roared out of range directly into the path of DSS Minstrel. Meanwhile, aboard the Skywatch frigate, Hollis Meyer was firmly ensconced at his own con with his battle harness fastened and more than a little perspiration visible across his forehead. Kilo Alpha 3 is on an intercept course. Estimated time to weapons range 48 seconds. While he was a more than capable executive officer, Serving in the shadow of one of Skywatch's most promising young skippers came with more than its share of challenges. Rebecca Islington was a shoot-from-the-hip captain with a sheaf of accomplishments to show for it. She was also a lethal and unpredictable space combatant, and she knew her ship backwards and forwards. Lieutenant Meyer, on the other hand, was a personnel and training specialist. He knew his job well, but Lord Nelson he wasn't. Under his command, Minstrel would acquit herself adequately, but there would be no flourishes, doffs of a hat or roses cast into the arena after the victory. Re-verify our range to target. Inbound contact range now 130,000 miles and closing on oblique course. Signals, raise Argen on priority frequency, Meyer said, as he pulled up the course information for Black 7. Channel open, and you are patched in. Captain, any chance you can remotely pilot the gunship out of our command area? Minstrel can't maneuver if we have to bring it inside our missile screen. Meyer spoke as he tried to configure access to the fleet-wide battle computer. I'm sure it can be done, XO, but unfortunately, there's nobody present on the bridge with the knowledge. Cal's never worked with a gunship wing before. Lieutenant Tixia could do it, but frankly I'd rather have her where she is. 
Can Lieutenant Tixia advise? The channel clicked. Affirmative, Mr. Meyer, Zoni said. But I'm a little preoccupied at the moment. I'll defer to the captain. With all due respect, Lieutenant, you can't defer to the captain. She can't take command of Argent, and you can't relinquish command of Argent. If we're going to do this, we need to do it by the book, Meyer said. We have a civilian in Sarn Energy Weapons Range. As you were, XO, this isn't the time, Islington replied. Ma'am, you and I both know- Mr. Meyer, Zoni interrupted. I'm not sure what all the protocol details here are, but at best I'm about eighth in line to command Argent, and I'm not aboard. Until we have orders otherwise, regardless of my regulation precedents, I'm going to defer to the only one of us lieutenants qualified to be addressed as captain. Fair enough? There was a tense moment of hesitation as all three Skywatch officers watched the tactical track of hostile contact, Kilo Alpha 3, bear down on Minstrel. Fair enough, Lieutenant. I don't have any special understanding of the regs. I just don't want to end this little war standing tall in a room full of admirals. Minstrel out. The frigate's bridge crew sat tense, waiting for orders. All right, tactical. Plot us an evasive course port side 331 Mark 290. Sound battle stations missile. Stand by the mains. All ahead attack speed. Aye, sir. The bridge lights shifted red as the action rigs activated the alert klaxons, signaling a change in battle configurations. Coming about to new course 331 Mark 290. Helm answering all ahead attack speed. Hollis gritted his teeth. He should have coordinated his run with the gunships, but without battle space telemetry, there was no way to synchronize the frigate systems with those of the Argent gunship. And talking a civilian through the procedure would be impossible even if he had the time. It was all the more disconcerting to be flying into battle with such a massive advantage in tonnage and a simultaneously massive disadvantage in firepower. But, advantage or not, Lieutenant Hollis Meyer had a civilian to protect and a command to preserve to say nothing of protecting the largely abandoned, irreplaceable leviathan in orbit behind him. As the agile little frigate veered out of the destroyer's optimum firing envelope, the Sarn ship decelerated and banked into a new course to pursue. Fortunately for the crew of the Minstrel, this was exactly what their ship was designed for, evading nose-to-nose -nose engagements while pouring anti-ship missiles into an attacker's teeth. Report weapon status! Missile stations report weapons banks 1 through 4 armed and standing by! Meyer checked his sidecon for possible electronic obstacles before entering the authorization for a standard attack pattern. Jettison launch! Aft missiles 2 and 3! The second watch tactical officer locked waveforms and released control to the firing sequencer. Four Phantom Tog anti ship missiles were blasted into space by each of two aft rotary launchers. Each bird went into sprint mode and screamed into space on a bluish white trail of chemical energy. The destroyer's forward point defense came to life like a stadium full of flash photography, pouring destructive energy bolts into the path of the oncoming missiles. Seven birds were ripped out of space by ugly explosions. The eighth punched the destroyer's forward shield with enough explosive energy to rock the entire ship. Internal fires initially caused by the gunship's attack reignited in the destroyer's dorsal weapons array. The sleek vessel started trailing plasma again as it banked port to try and close range with the dodging escort frigate. Chapter 25. Senior Lieutenant Rebecca Islington recognized she was out of time. She only had 8% power from a single reactor, but it was going to have to do. She took the pilot station on Argent's bridge. She expertly fastened her six-point harness and pulled up the ship's maneuvering overlay. Then she activated her comlink. All right, Brogan. It's you and me. We need to get Argent in the fight. Does the con have main power at command? Affirmative, bridge. You're going to need to get us to 40 degrees starboard delta and synchronize engines 1, 2, 7, and 8. If you overshoot, we're going to catch the edge of the atmosphere on our starboard quarter and lose a flight deck. If you undermaneuver, we go down nose first. But that's only if we stay in one piece. Acknowledged, engineer. It's been a while, but I've had my moments at the wheel. Stand by to transfer all power to engines. Aye, ma'am. Just remember flying this thing is like kicking whales down the beach. If you turn the wheel, she'll get around to it next Tuesday. I'm going to leave power levels and vectors to you. Give me some kind of clock so I know when to break range and bank us to bearings level flight. Stand by on priority interest ship. Captain Islington shook her hands to relieve the tension in her wrists and fingers, and then she took Argent's controls, throttle in her left hand, and the manual navigation bar in her right. Cal, you watch our deflectors. If feedback energy breaks 10%, that means we're cutting atmosphere. Give me the count and stay with it. Aye, ma'am. Navigational deflectors to maximum. We are cleared for manual flight mode. 
Cal grabbed the edges of his own console, anticipating what was about to happen. Under normal procedures, auto systems would pull heavy or super heavy vessels out of orbit due to the precision synchronization necessary. This time it was going to be done by two officers and an engineering chief separated by 30 decks. Breakaway course starboard, vectoring 040 relative, all ahead full. The immensity of the power that surged into the structure of Argent's decks and bulkheads was almost more than Captain Islington was prepared for. She knew every sound her own ship could make. The almost seismic subsonic resonance was like nothing she had ever felt before. Her entire body shuddered. As the engines were filled with practically the entirety of Reactor 4's power, Battleship Hull 740 started to overfly its orbit. Captain Islington waited until her relative forward velocity was enough to overcome the first inertial push. She held the throttle tightly, drawing more and more energy from the mighty vessel's portside engines. Watch that coolant flow, Corporal, Brogan shouted across the auxiliary control bay. If it drops too much, it means turbulence in the transfer mechanisms. We've got no heat sink capacity left in this thing at all, so we can't miss our numbers. Affirmative, Chief, Dempsey yelled back. He sort of understood some of what Brogan had shouted. It was amazing what a completely untrained combat marine could learn in a half hour at a reactor mass control console. Islington held onto the controls like she was trying to tame a Mustang. Report tactical! Feedback now! 0 0.7 and holding! Islington decided not to wait. She banked Argent's starboard edge and watched the readout. 2 degrees. 3. Reverse starboard engines. 1% per clock second. Affirmative bridge! You've got it! Brogan shouted. The sound of the coolant roaring through the connector deck at supersonic speeds made him feel like he was in a fusion-powered hurricane. He held onto the electronic shielding cage doorway near the auxiliary power controls to ride out the captain's breakaway maneuver. Argent's bridge deck began to vibrate noticeably. It didn't look like it from the relatively peaceful view of space on the forward screen. traveling more than 22,000 miles per hour to fight a planet's gravity, with four fusion-powered engines each. The diameter of a 12-story building was having more than a little effect on the outer hull and navigational screens. A violent fire began to heat Argent's port quarter armor array. High-energy flames trailed more than 200 miles behind the enormous ship. Starboard course delta now 11 degrees, Islington shouted. Trailing feedback levels now 3% and rising. Cal replied. Everyone realized it at once. The ship was skidding, traveling faster forward than starboard with its leading edge pointed away from the direction of fastest travel. Brogan's voice howled over the intraship. We're skipping on the atmosphere, Captain. Don't overthrust your port engines or we'll buckle the escape track. Acknowledged, Engineer. Port engines to 40%. Lieutenant Islington could feel the gigantic ship fighting the forces of physics. Ultimately, Argent had to win. That's what these big, heavy vessels were made to do. It was the principle that allowed humans into space in the first place. That said, the laws of physics never made things easy. As she pushed the manual navigation to starboard, the energetic reactions from her engines and the very real physical obstacle of an entire planet's extreme upper atmosphere sheared against the battleship's drive field. She nudged the throttle forward, holding the huge handle with all the strength she could muster. The bridge was experiencing the spacecraft equivalent of a medium-sized earthquake now. Rebecca Islington held on to the pilot's controls, wondering if she was going to fly the biggest fireball in Skywatch history right into the Bayoni Ocean. Feedback energy 6%. Climbing! Islington cursed under her breath. The engine power balance wasn't right. That wasn't necessarily to say it was wrong. A pilot more experienced with the idiosyncrasies of a heavy ship's flight envelope would likely spot the problem and have an instant fix. The captain's problem was she didn't have the experience, and she was being asked to get that experience while clawing her way out of a big object's very dangerous maneuver and a much larger object's gravity well at the same time. Starboard course delta now 27 degrees. Feedback energy now 8.8 .8 and climbing! Brogan's voice barked again over the intraship. We hit 10 and we'll cavitate our drive field! He ran across auxiliary control to do a quick inspection of the coolant transfers. What he saw was more terrifying than what his captain was attempting on the bridge. The relay valve was white hot and filling the entire chamber with a ghostly pale glow. Corporal, open auxiliary coolant transfers. Say again, the Marine shouted from the other side of the machinery. Open the transfers, all of them. 
Negative, Chief. The control console reports mechanical assists are all locked in the closed position. It will take ten minutes to disassemble the braces and standards. Brogan stumbled backwards and grabbed an overhead gantry ledge for support. He gasped for air. He could feel the ambient heat from the valve from where he was standing almost 100 feet away. If it ruptured, the backblast would vaporize three decks. He activated his comlink. Bridge, you've got 30 seconds to power down or we're going to lose primary engine cooling. Islington's blood ran cold. She fought the urge to bank the ship further and just run for the heading goal of 40 degrees. The problem was if she overshot, the big ship would end up flying engines first into a 10,000 degree firestorm. If the ruptured drive field and cataclysmic heat didn't kill everyone, the G-forces would. The problem wasn't heading, it was the thrust vector. There was too much lateral power and not enough medial power. The captain made a snap decision. Engineering, bring port engines to 45% and increase counter power only one half percent every clock second on your starboard engines. Decrease coolant volume to match power output. Affirmative, ma'am. Port engines to 45% power, Brogan shouted. It was a long shot, but still a rather inventive idea. The engineering chief knew his captain was no slouch, but he never expected potentially brilliant last-second solutions. That was what engineers were supposed to do, not flight officers. Feedback energy now 9.5% and climbing. Come on, Argent. I know I'm just a frigate skipper, but give me a break. Islington held her helm, using every ounce of strength to will the huge ship where she wanted her to go. From Minstrel's point of view, what happened next would have made even friendly captains hold their shock frames a little tighter. A giant of a ship banked powerfully and began her turn out of Bione 3's orbital track. When the forward hull crossed the 40-degree delta and the engine synchronized into a forward course, the frigate was momentarily caught in its fleetmate's gargantuan shadow. It was enough to steal the breath of everyone on Minstrel's Bridge. A cheer from Skywatch personnel went up over the command net as Destroyer 3 suddenly found itself out of position and in the path of an awakened Leviathan. The Sarn vessel dove away and kicked up its engines into an evasive course. Target Kilo Alpha 3 veering off, sir. Meanwhile, the lead Sarn destroyer was now head-to-head -head with a vessel that outgunned it 60 to 1. All right, Cal. Open a hailing frequency. Engage real-time translation protocols. Islington stood, fitting with something at her collar. Ma'am, I... Islington squared herself to the forward view screen. Ensign Grant decided not to press the issue and tentatively activated the battleship's transmitters. Channel open. Attention Sarn warships. This is Captain Rebecca Islington of the Skywatch battleship Argent. We have you under our weapons. You are ordered to stand down and retreat from core space. If you do not comply at once, we will engage your formation with lethal force. Acknowledge. Cal had to admit his captain was doing a magnificent job of being in command of a 34-deck ship with a crew of five. All of them knew if the Sarn took a moment to run a clean life sign scan of Argent, the jig would be up. All Cal could do was flood local space with as much ECM noise as possible and pray. All at once, the forward view screen snapped into a view of the emblem of the Sarn Star Empire. Islington swallowed reflexively and raised her chin. Either she looked the part, or her words weren't likely to be heeded. Aboard Minstrel, Meyer sat up straight in the command chair. Their view of the Argent transmission was the same as the Sarn commander's. Islington's XO, however, was the first to notice his captain was wearing twin eagle rank insignia. It was a flagrant violation of regulations to impersonate a superior officer, especially one three full ranks higher, but Hollis had to admit it was a clever touch. The Sarn might be ill acquainted with Skywatch regulations, but they certainly knew the difference between a lieutenant and a captain. Hollis wasn't entirely sure if this particular Sarn officer would know how relatively young and attractive Islington was compared to most other Skywatch captains, but it was too late now. Captain Islington. Humans never seemed to get the hang of Sarn appearance. Their ships were built like volcanic caverns, with atmospheres that would incinerate a human respiratory system in seconds. Their visages were a close match. This is first-scale Yala of Sarn and Vector Gliss. You invade Sarn space and destroy our vessels. This is an act of war. The seething red interiors with the distorted dark reptilian faces made it difficult for human personnel to gauge reactions in these confrontations. Yala, however, wasn't hard to read at all. Cal's face had long since drained of its color. He did note with a small tinge of optimism the Sarn captain wasn't quite as belligerent as their race normally was. 
Being literally in the shadow of your opponent's ship would tend to moderate one's attitude, the tactical officer thought. But he also remembered he and his dice-rolling CO represented 40% of Argent's manpower. Come now, first scale. The Bioni system was ceded to the core council in the Gitarn Compact years ago. Surely you have been advised by your government this is core space. Your ships were weapons hot and on an obvious attack course. We simply defended ourselves. You annexed our Triluminum claims. That is forbidden under the terms. We claim this space as reparations. What do you propose, First Scale? I cannot speak for my government, but I will speak for my ship. You are intruding in my command area while we are engaged in rescue operations. We've already sunk one member of your task force. I have three flight decks full of fighters just waiting for a green light and a target. If you want to see Sarn space again, I recommend you disengage. First Scale. Yala looked askance at his own screen, performing the reptilian equivalent of a raised eyebrow. How long have you been in command of such a powerful ship, Captain? I relieved Jason Hunter a month ago. He was injured during a recent engagement. Interesting story, Cal thought. And not far from the truth. Indeed. Please send my condolences. You seem so... How do the humans say? Adolescent. I'll take that as a compliment, first scale. I have a rather grueling training regimen that keeps me in shape. I spend my off time studying weapons and tactics. Nice, Cal thought. Hollis Meyer sat open-mouthed at his captain's brinksmanship. At best, his side had a pair of threes. By Captain Islington's manner, you would think she was betting kings full of nines. Meanwhile, first scale Yala was far less impressed. Although he was fairly certain there was something not quite right about the situation, he had to respect the fact if Argent fell over drunk, she would crush what was left of his task force. He had been advised the ship was abandoned. As a target for military intelligence and plunder, she was one thing. If she were minimally crude and opened up with even a wildly inaccurate barrage, it would be devastating. Toe-to-toe, -to -toe, even three full-strength destroyers didn't stand a chance against the fury of a fully combat-capable battleship, to say nothing of her fighter and gunship wings. Yala also had to concede the fact he no longer had three destroyers. Very well, Argent. We will leave it to the Emperor to decide your fates. I strongly suggest you return to core space before we return. In Vector Gliss transmission ends, the screen snapped back to the Sarn emblem. Before the autosystems reactivated the internal carrier signal, Islington started unfastening her borrowed rank insignia and whirled on her tactical officer. Recover Black Seven right this second. I don't care how many ships or personnel it takes. Clear? Clear, ma'am. Coding your message. Chapter 26 the entire crew of Nightwing 6 watched in stomach-churning silence as three enemy vessels approached their position. They had already apparently written off the Saratoga, as none of the three even bothered to scan it for range, position, or signatures. This put to rest, for all intents and purposes, any chance of survivors, which only made the possible consequences of Doverly's risky decision that much greater. If detected, the best an SR vessel could hope for in this situation was to run but they were too far away from any friendly reinforcements to have a clear direction. Even if they managed to survive the chase, they simply had nowhere to go except back to Argent, and that vessel was on the other side of a jump gate. Navigating that far while being shot at would be eventual suicide, no matter how skillful their evasive maneuvers. What the Nightwing vessels were good at was infiltrating enemy territory, finding survivors and prisoners and getting them healed and home. Commander Darverly knew if her vessel remained stationary and maintained its quiet status, it was quite literally possible that the first clue they were there would be if one of the enemy vessels physically bumped into them. Even at ranges of less than a quarter mile, a Nightwing was virtually impossible to detect with electronics, even without it activating an advanced cloak. The scientists and engineers in charge of inventing the design had perfected the art of low-power ECM to the point where minuscule transmissions were enough to scatter enemy range finding radar, and laser-assisted tracking scanners, and make it look to the enemy like they were all working properly at the same time. The first researcher to demonstrate a working prototype often told stories of onlookers using the word voodoo when trying to explain what they had seen. Nevertheless, what those scientists had not perfected yet was a way to calm the nerves of the crews aboard their undetectable ships. For the crew of Nightwing 6, Having three Sarn frigates within 10000 miles was like having three hungry mountain lions in the kitchen. 
For Commander Doverly, it was the hell of indecision that made her situation that much more unbearable. She got up from her chair and paced, trying to find a way to calm the fighting energy in her fingers and arms. Were she aboard her fighter and flying with the Jacks, the outcome of this battle would be unlikely to differ much from any of her other battles. The Jack of Hearts was as well known for her mastery of kinetic weaponry as she was for her skill in the surgical ward. Many were the occasions where Hearts put a round through the right electronic component at the wrong time for the enemy and won the day for her side. She desperately wished this was one of those times. What are they looking for, then? Other ships? Emissions signatures or trails? Some clue as to why the Saratoga was here, Honora replied, staring hard enough at the viewscreen to burn its surface. They've got enormous firepower to back them up, and little else to do, apparently. Maybe they think they're just covering their tracks. You sound frustrated, ma'am, Joss said. He wore a concerned expression. Just one of the dangers of wandering around the galaxy with no weapons, Ensign, Doverly replied. Our job is to rescue and heal the sick. What I'd rather do at the moment is magnetize a couple of satchel charges and clamp them to their fuel relays. If it makes you feel any better, they've swept our position four times and they haven't generated a range signal. It's pretty lazy scanner work, to be honest. Even if they got something, I'm at least a little unsure if they'd know what to do about it. Doverly didn't answer right away. The rest of her crew could see that particular attentive posture, however, and they knew she was up to something, at least mentally. She continued staring at the Sarn formation on the forward tactical display. Her face now wore the expression of an experienced warrior instead of the concern of a live-saving physician. Our power suits aren't cloaked, she said flatly. Nobody answered. They just watched as she began formulating an attack plan, of all things. To be fair, it was to be expected. She didn't earn the lofty rank of commander or the title of executive officer signing food requisitions in a core systems warehouse. But this ship can extend its scattering field if we power down non-essential systems and increase reactor output to match. Aye, ma'am. We've got the extra power when we're dark like this, Joss replied, unsure of what his skipper was contemplating. And once inside any of those ships' drive fields, a power suit would be both impossible to get a fix on and impossible to target for any of the ships. The rest of the bridge crew remained silent. They all had their suspicions as to what Doverly was planning. The more she spoke, the more detail was being added, until finally, the murky shadows of the plan came into focus for the entire bridge crew. You're going to attack three frigates in a power suit, ma'am? Honora began cycling the ship's munitions at one of the command consoles. In a manner of speaking, we need to give them something else to look at instead of the Saratoga, or whatever they are hunting for out here. A crippled frigate would be a good start. It might even be enough to prevent them from pursuing us back to our rendezvous with Argent. But ma'am, you can't just float out there and wire up one of their ships, Joss exclaimed. It's too dangerous. I can't, Ensign. Doverly raised an eyebrow. Joss closed his eyes and reset his attitude. Okay, okay. Begging the commander's pardon, ma'am. You shouldn't float out there because you're our best surgeon and we might still have casualties aboard the Saratoga. Ensign. If it's a choice between one doctor over another treating casualties on the Saratoga and losing this crew and ship, that's no choice at all. If there are injured aboard, they are the top priority, and we are expendable. Doverly found what she was looking for and began drilling down to the technical specifications of the extravehicular toolsets available on a Nightwing power suit. It would be one thing if this were a rescue with fighter or gunship cover, but there's no way we can expect to hack our way through two battlecruisers and a squadron of unusually curious frigates to rescue the Saratoga survivors with only our cloak. We need a diversion. If we're not here to save them, then why are we here at all? If my plan works, Ensign, we just might solve both problems at once. What I need right now is a polarity field, and I think we've got just the components I need in our engineering bay. Chapter 27 Yili Curtis really didn't mind being known as the best armed engineer in the fleet. She had long ago made it clear to her promotion committees and her commanding officers she wasn't likely to change her ways to fit what Skywatch considered a normal department chief. Captain Hunter promoted her anyway. One thing Jason Hunter knew better than practically any other officer was that talent beats idiosyncrasy without exception, and he had the accomplishments to prove it. To be fair, an engineer who tinkers with weapons wasn't unusual in the slightest. It was just that Yili was really good at it. So good. In fact, 
She had already made a career out of effective improvements in her own personal sidearms and had advanced the art of handheld weaponry a few paces just from her own research. It was for those reasons nobody should have been surprised when she emerged from the Angel Rescue Unit wearing a reinforced tack suit outfitted with a mechanical power frame, twin independently powered combination medical casts, and braces for her feet and knees, and not one, but two autonomous anti-personnel bots floating along, one on either side. She had also made some semi-approved changes to her power suit helmet, so she could use its rangefinder and targeting systems to guide the weapons on her AP bots. The floating attack units were deceptively simple-looking contraptions. They were essentially counter-grav-equipped lookbots, each built around a high-powered rapid-fire anti-personnel rifle, very similar to the ones installed in the deck alert systems aboard ship. If armed, they would independently target anything Yili looked at using infrared or laser-guided optics, essentially turning Argent's chief engineer into a walking attack helicopter. What made the whole thing three times as dangerous was the fact Lieutenant Curtis wasn't planning to cover ground on foot. Skywatch Engineering had planned way ahead when they came up with the schematics for the Copernicus Corvette. Surveying planetary surfaces was something all engineers knew might be necessary, especially if they were tasked with finding energy, food, and water sources on unfamiliar worlds. They also knew air or space platforms might be obscured, down, or absent. So they went back to the drawing board one more time to invent the Tanto. Miniaturized counter-grav was never intended to be limited to autonomous machinery, at least in fleet engineering circles. There were all kinds of applications of the technology possible, and the officer corps knew the difference between a successful operation and a beautifully executed masterpiece of an operation usually involved some measure of altitude. The father of the Tanto recon bike was an old motorcycle mechanic and Skywatch Marine NCO, who never sought promotion above the rank of sergeant. He spent his off-duty hours in a garage tinkering with one idea or another until he took the wheels off a civilian superbike one day and started adding military-grade hardware to what was left over. Before long, he had a flying motorcycle. Not long after that, he had enclosed the mechanism with a 360 canopy, added standard communications, lights, life support, and sensors and then reinstalled the wheels as an optionally deployable all-terrain drive system. The result delighted the Skywatch engineering fraternity to the point where the Tanto's inventor was twice decorated, once by Skywatch fleet for meritorious achievement, and then again by the Skywatch Marines with an outstanding commendation medal. Sergeant Joseph E. Big Mountain Gerard thus became the only NCO in Skywatch Marine history to wear competing achievement medals. Chief Engineer Yili Curtis happened to be one of the engineers most impressed by Gerard's invention. She insisted on hauling at least two of the bikes with her whenever the engineering corvette was sent on a mission. It had only been hours since Copernicus I had crash-landed, but its commander had already rebuilt practically everything fixable and was now sitting on an idling Tonto, lashing up a command net between herself, her AP bots, the two look-down probes she had launched hours before, and her boat. Zoni had provided her with the coordinates of the unidentified human personnel four miles from the crash site. It was time to figure out just who those people were. Yili suspected they were Copernicus crew members in need of rescue, which was one of the reasons she had evacuated the Angel and restocked its power and consumables. Once she had bearing and distance, she would be able to offer medical assistance and bring some of her team back to base so they could get their boat back into the action. After all, orbital engineering had been deployed to the surface of Bione 3 to complete a mission, and a battleship's chief engineer was the least likely crew member to leave any mission unaccomplished. Curtis flipped up the ground clearance releases, revved the engines of her sleek recon bike a few times, and then roared off towards Zoni's coordinates, with her AP bots racing along on either side. Chapter 28 Lieutenant, we're not getting anything from Black 7. We have one strong life sign aboard, but we've been hailing the ship now for almost twenty minutes, and we've got nothing. Zoni gently veered her fighter out of Argent's Flight 1 approach ILS corridor, and activated all her friendly transponders. She knew Black 7 had to be operating on auto systems. If it was, and she crossed its defense perimeter without identification, she could very easily find herself nose to nose with yet another very dangerous opponent. Jackrabbit 994 pressurized her cockpit waited for the temperature and gas mixtures to stabilize, and then unfastened her flight helmet. No sense in scaring her sister-in-arms. Minutes later, 
her fighter approached to a range of two miles and slowed to station keeping. Zoni was appropriately impressed. The gunship hovered in space, damaged battle screens still active, and weapons fully charged. It was hurt, but still ready for the next fight. The sight was reminiscent of a big jungle cat sitting on an outcrop watching the nearby forest. Black Seven was even oriented away from her mothership, as if vigilant for new threats. The Argent Signals officer ran an EM scan and queried the vessel for system status. The gunship's power systems were fluctuating at just over 60% capacity, but life support and drive field integrity were well within specs. It was still nearly 80% battleworthy, which was astonishing considering it had taken a full power alpha strike at near point blank range only minutes ago. For Zoni, it was all a profound relief, as it meant she could remotely pilot the ship home. But first, she needed its pilot's help. Black Seven's center comsat screen activated. Hi, my name is Zoni. What's your name? Abren was still trembling. Her shock harness, pilot station, helmet, and stuffed animals formed a cocoon around her on the gunship's flight deck, and she was fully prepared by this point to scratch, bite, or kick anything that got within five yards of the command couch. But she was looking out the corner of her eye at the pink-haired girl who had suddenly appeared on her communications panel. Zoni was smiling. Abran thought she looked nice enough, but she wasn't taking any chances after what she had been through. Abran. The girl's voice was almost too quiet for the comlink patch to pick up. Captain Islington and Ensign Grant stood on Argent's bridge, and Lieutenant Meyer stood on Minstrel's bridge, all watching the conversation and hoping Zoni could gain the girl's trust before something else went wrong. A tarantula hawk gunship gone haywire would be a medium sized nightmare. The only nearby ship heavy enough to stare it down was Argent herself. Every officer on the scene was well aware she wasn't exactly at her best at the moment. The fact was, they needed Abren's help. Black Seven's battle computer was still on alert and wouldn't allow the kind of remote connection Argent's crew needed to recover the vessel without either the command pilot's authorization or powering down the ship and having it towed, which wasn't practical with its current onboard personnel. Essentially, the only person who could persuade Black Seven to come home was nine years old, and she wasn't in the best of moods either. Hi, Abran. That's a neat name. You know what? You did such a good job piloting your spaceship that me and my captain want you to join our pilot's club. Do you want to? No response. Everyone in our club gets a special badge, and their name goes on a big screen in our clubhouse. And you can visit our ship's kitchen anytime you want for every flavor of ice cream you can think of. Zoni was working as hard as she could to be patient. She knew there hadn't been a nine-year-old yet born that wouldn't respond to offers of free ice cream. After a long pause, the command net clicked. Can boots and checkers be in it? The captains on Argent and Minstrel's bridges almost collapsed from relief. Sure, anyone who sits in a pilot's couch and flies in one of our ships can be in our club. Another pause. Okay. It wasn't a ringing endorsement, but some things were to be expected after going around with an alien warship. Yay! We love it when new people join our pilot's club. Okay, we're going to fly back to my ship now, so there's just one thing I need you to do. Right next to your seat there should be a little checkerboard of square buttons, and they should all be the color red. The top buttons are numbered 1 through 5. Do you see them? There was a pause. Does one of them say electrical? Yes, that's the one. What I need you to do is use the top row of buttons and press the number 31351 button at a time. Say the number printed on the button when you press it, okay? Okay, 3, 1, 3, 5. Very good. Now there's just one more thing to do. On the pilot's console, right below the screen where you can see me, there's a big wide green button that says commit. Zoni spelled it for her. Can you see it? Uh-huh. Okay, reach up and press that button just one time. Zoni watched her own comsat console and breathed a sigh of relief when she saw Black Seven's battle computer status switch over. She rapidly configured her own flight systems to instruct the damaged gunship to follow her back to Argent. Okay, here we go! Buck Four's pilot banked her fighter around and nudged the engines forward to a velocity of 25 FPS. The tactical track displayed the larger gunship as it banked to starboard and fell into line. What's happening? Everything is just fine, Abren. Your ship is going to fly itself all the way back to our clubhouse and land, just like my ship. After that, we're going to see about your badge and new member party. 
Zoni would have freely admitted she had no idea what she was doing, but she had known more than a few trained flight officers who had considerable trouble handling the unique stresses of interstellar combat. She had no idea how it would affect a girl barely old enough to know how to do division. She did note with some relief Black Seven was holding her course. Zoni authorized ILS for both ships and keyed her control microphone. Argent Skywatch, this is Jackrabbit994 requesting approach clearance to Flight 1. Acknowledge. You're looking good, Buck 4. You are approach clear for landing on Flight 1. Four miles, call the ball. Affirmative, space lane control. Buck 4 has the ball. 30 seconds. Lieutenant Tixia switched Black 7's auto systems over to lock its approach with the ILS corridor and performed the same ritual to clear the gunship's landing course. Once inside Argent's battle screen and drive field, the capital ship's tractor beams guided both the fighter and gunship into side-by-side -side approaches and brought them both into the aft bay of Flight Deck 1 for perfectly synchronized landings. Decon sensors scanned both ships and detected no medical conditions or contaminants. The Flight Deck's aft directional screens re-stabilized. The fighter's egress indicators switched to green and Zoni popped the canopy on her fighter. She was halfway down the deck ladder when Captain Islington and Chief Brogan ran up. Welcome back, Lieutenant! Islington exclaimed. I hope we left your ship in better shape than we found it. Zoni hopped down to the deck. I'd say you did the impossible, Captain, and then one-upped yourself. Nice to finally meet you in person. Tixia put her helmet under one arm and shook Islington's hand. Likewise. Of course I stand down and relinquish command. Normally I'd return to my ship, but for the time being, the six of us are your entire crew. Zoni wasn't entirely sure what to say. It was the first time she had ever assumed command of any vessel larger than a Yellow Jacket fighter. Understood, she keyed her comm link. Command computer access. Identification, please, came Dominique's familiar voice. Senior Lieutenant Zoni Tixia. Lieutenant Zoni Tixia acknowledged. How can Argent help you today? Zoni swallowed. Major steps forward in her career often seemed to happen unexpectedly, and this was one of the biggest. She closed her eyes hoping she wasn't about to make a giant mess of things. I assume command of this vessel. Authorization Hummingbird 8877. A pause. DSS Argent now under the command of Senior Lieutenant Zoni Tixia. Congratulations, Captain, Islington said with an encouraging smile. Any orders? Zoni's eyes were still a little wider than normal. She set her helmet on the wing of her fighter. As my first official act, I have to make sure the newest member of our pilot's club gets the ice cream she was promised. 